All right, welcome everybody. It is April 5th and uh, about 1.15. And we are here today with the Vermont National Guard with the Adjutant General um, Knight and we have a slew of other people here, some who will testify and some who are here as guests of the Adjutant General coming to see us work. So um, behavior please. And <laughs> for us or them? <laughs> <laughs> From us, Representative Kalaki. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, this is, uh, we are here today to get the official um, report back on the sexual assault and sexual harassment report. This is um, a document, or this is something that we've requested um, put into law some years ago now, and um, annually or biannually, um, biennially. Um, we've asked for a report back on the internal reports um, that are contained within. And so really without, without um, belaboring the fact, I just want to welcome Adjutant General Knight. Thanks, and sir. His team and let you start um, and take over. So and committee, I think what we do is we'll have them present and then we'll open the floor up for questions to the relevant witness. And um, let's go around the room. Um, well, I'll start today, because I'm sitting in a very different angle. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a different angle. I'm usually sitting here. Um, so I'm seeing profiles I haven't seen before. Um, so I'm Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury. I represent Waterbury. Uh, Bolton, Huntington, and Buell's Gore. Tiff Bloomley from the South End of Burlington. Uh, John Kalaki from South Burlington. Representative Lisa Hango, I represent Franklin, Berkshire, Richford, and Highgate. Uh, Representative Matt Byrong, Virgins, represent five towns in Northwest Addison County. I'm Joe Parsons, I represent the towns of Newberry, Topsom, and Grock. I'm Tommy Waltz, I represent Berry City. I'm Mary Howard. I represent Rutland City District 5-3. Representative Barton Murphy, I represent Fairfax and represent Franklin 2. Representative Chip Troiano, I represented Hardwick, Standard, and Walden in the Northeast Kingdom, and I'm vice chair of this committee. And Representatives Hango and Byron are two-thirds of the triumvirate who chair the National Guard Caucus, um, which was started I believe, <laughs> a year and a half ago. Um, or less yeah. to allow, I mean, our committee's name is General Housing, General Comma <laughs> Housing and Military Affairs. And um, obviously, guard issues are, guard and veteran issues are part of our military affairs portfolio. And so, um, Representative Hango and Byron and Sibelia had come and said they wanted to make sure that. Uh, uh, access to this con the conversations that were happening in the state house um, and for people who were interested in in that um, could form a caucus and and we said sure and so they've had uh, monthly meetings for the last year and a half just to be able to um, let the guard inform us a little bit better about what their work has been over the course of time so um it's been a good development, I think, in terms of it's less committee time, which isn't always fun. Um, but but we reserve that time now for um, really for important reports like this. And so thank you for coming in. General Knight, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So hello, committee. It's been too long, I think. I'm, I'm happy to be here and not on Zoom. So today we're going to present the uh, annual Vermont National Guard report on sexual harassment, sexual assault, and that's inclusive of our gender report. So I'm joined by a number of our personnel today, Ms. Nikki Sorrell to my right, our state sexual assault response coordinator. And then uh, Mr. Duffy Jameson, our state equal employment manager. He's to my left, Ms. Serena Fernari, who's our Air National Guard sexual assault response coordinator in the back there. Uh, Major Kurt Kaplan's our judge advocate general. Uh, Mr. Ken Gregg, our Deputy Adjutant General, Colonel Tracy Poyer, who's our Vermont Army National Guard Chief of Staff, and Colonel Adam Rice, who's our Air Guard uh, Chief of Staff. I also have a number of our Air Guard and Army Guard soldiers and officers, airmen, um, and NCOs here. 
And the reason I asked them to come down, uh, this is an example of continuing professional development in our organization. Uh, a lot of folks, unfortunately, a lot of what I do is transparent to our guard. So we're working pretty diligently to change that. And this is an example of that. So before we transition to Ms. Sorrell briefing on the content of the report and the initiatives we've undertaken in the past year, uh, what I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, is first provide data on the equity of opportunity in our guard. I, see, I think sometimes we run short of time and we miss that. I, I view that as a critical piece of, of the information we share. So the information I'm about to brief highlights the women NCOs and officers selected for challenging leadership assignments. Each was selected because they're best qualified for the job. And when elected to this position, one of my primary focuses was improving, improving equity of opportunity in our organization. We are correcting, correcting literally centuries of combat arms being exclusively male occupations. It won't happen quickly, but I'm convinced, as I've discussed with Representative Bloomley, we can continue growing opportunity for women in our guard. I also know we can't do it alone. It would be immensely helpful to our enterprise to have women leaders across Vermont refer young women who have a desire to serve to a career with our National Guard. So while I, it may be a little tedious, but I want to get into some of the statistics, and, and this really is some of them. I didn't want to put them on here, but I think it, it reflects the direction of the organization. In our Air National Guard, 21.2% of assigned personnel are women. Conversely, 23% of the leadership positions, that's position E7 and above, so a senior non-commissioned officer and above is commissioned officers, are women. 66% of the first sergeants, that's senior non-commissioned officer leaders at the wing, are women. 50% of the group superintendents, that's the senior colonel level non-commissioned officer leader, are women. 35% of the overall chief master sergeants, the E9 population, are women. 31.5% of the company grade officers, these are lieutenants and captains, fairly new to the organization, serving in the wing are women. 28% of the majors and lieutenant colonels, the field grade officers are women. The 158th force support flight commander and the director of operations are women. There are two women currently in training as F-35 fighter pilot candidates. One is nearing completion of her flight training, the other beginning a very challenging two-year process. That is a first. The maintenance group commander, one of the four colonel level commands at the fighter wing, is a woman. That is a first. 25% of the new enlistments into the Air National Guard are women. In FY21, the Airman of the Year, the Non-Commissioned Officer of the Year, and the Senior Non-Commissioned Officer of the Year were all women. It's important to note here is that they were selected by three objective separate boards of their peers. That is a first. And just as an aside, the Air National Guard per capita representation of persons of color exceeds that of Vermont, 4.3% at the wing, 1.4% in Vermont. In the Army National Guard, 14.6% of assigned personnel are women. In FY21, we recruited 44 women into the Army National Guard, 22.1% of our total. That is an increase from FY20, in which only 14% of our new recruits were women. 20% of the lieutenants in the Army National Guard are women. 17% of our non-commissioned officers are women. We have 13 female soldiers currently serving combat arms positions. Those are your armor, cavalry, infantry, and field artillery. We've had two recently commissioned directly into combat arms and one enlisted. Those are also firsts. The incoming director of the Joint Staff of the Vermont National Guard is a woman. It's important to note that is a Brigadier General billet once she's confirmed by the Senate this spring or early summer, she'll be the first female general officer, I believe, in the history of our Army National Guard. Personnel Directorate Sergeant Major is a woman. The Vermont National Guard Logistics Directorate Sergeant Major is a woman who also does her drill weekends as the Brigade Support Battalion Sergeant Major. Vermont National Guard Deputy U.S. Purchasing and Fiscal Officer, a colonel, is a woman. That is a first. This spring, two female lieutenant colonels will command our Brigade Engineer Battalion and our Brigade Support Battalion. That's 50% of the battalion commands in the entirety of the Brigade, the Infantry Brigade, and that's our largest unit. Of note, the entire Brigade Support Battalion leadership team, the commander, the executive officer, and the sergeant major are all women. That is a first. 
and we remain the first and only guard state to open every position in our Army National Guard to the recruitment of women. So I'd like to do now, Mr. Chair, as I'll transition to some of the work we've done to address sexual harassment and sexual assault. And then I'll turn it over to Ms. Sorrell so to brief the body of the, of the uh, report. I would tell this committee that I'm extremely proud of the work our Guard has done in addressing sexual harassment and sexual assault. Our team has shared best practices with other Guard states and with National Guard Bureau. Most significantly is our focus on prevention. And we do that while sustaining our response resources and our capability. So for the past year, I've served on the General Officer Steering Committee with National Guard Bureau, one of two adjutants general asked for by name of the five total serving on the committee. Following a year's work with the Sexual Assault Prevention Task Force, we've drafted a complete revision of the National Guard approach to addressing sexual harassment and sexual assault. This effort has resulted in a prevention plan of action incorporating six lines of effort, leadership, training and education, culture and climate, communication, partnerships, and resources. The task force identified 19 actionable items within these lines of effort, and I will furnish that report to the committee if you'd like, Mr. Chair, once I receive the final copy. I appreciate that. As a result of our efforts, Vermont's one of the first guard states selected to receive funding and staffing for an integrated violence prevention workforce. We may receive funding as soon as the fourth quarter of this year. Ms. Sorrell, our state sexual assault response coordinator, is part of the sexual assault prevention task force working with Guard Bureau, working to incorporate and impl implement the 82 recommendations from the DOD Interim Review Commission, the IRC, is supported by Congress. That I know of, I was the only adjutant general to speak with the DOD IRC. We initiated a reach up campaign in August of 20, 2021, providing an anonymous means for soldiers and airmen to utilize our Vermont National Guard app. And they can reach out to our state sexual assault response coordinator, our provost marshal, public affairs, our state equal employment manager, equal, up, equal opportunity officer, our inspector general, our provost marshal team, and direct to me if they need to. We simply can't address issues, issues that we don't know about. Last year, my sexual assault response coordinator informed me of a file sharing website containing pornographic images taken without consent. A significant number of those files contain compromising images of military members of all branches from multiple installations, inclusive of the National Guard, entire discussion threads and file sharing dedicated to the military. I reported this to the Chief of Guard Bureau, the Army Provost Marshal General and our Attorney General for their action in taking that site down. The Vermont National Guard is in the process of establishing a joint directorate, which places all behavioral health, family programs, resiliency, diversity, equity, inclusion, equal opportunity, state equal employment management position, and our SARC VA, the Sexual Assault Response Coordinator and Victim Advocates, under one umbrella with direct access to the Adjutant General. Our Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Program Specialists are working on a new training initiative involving more conversations with our Guard members, focusing on emotional intelligence and healthy relationships. In 2020, we established the Provost Marshal Team with the assistance of this committee. They're engaged with local law enforcement. They chain a command to help close the communication gap between Vermont law enforcement agencies and our guard. I'm working with National Guard Bureau to make this team a full-time resource. I met with that team this past drill weekend. The need is there, the workload is there for them. Uh, they're a valuable resource and if we can find the funding, we're gonna do that. We hosted a series of awareness events in FY21. Ms. Sorrell will provide details on these events as a part of her testimony. Uh, they're also, they start on page 10 and continue for several pages in the report. All of these are designed to inform, educate, and build solidarity across the organization to eliminate sexual harassment and sexual assault from our guard. We've moved forward with quarterly publication of the status of discipline. This report reflects administrative action taken for those members of the Vermont National Guard acting contrary to standards and regulations and provides transparency for the members of our guard. The Vermont National Guard has revised our approach to professional development, focusing on more frequent engagements, allowing us to fill in gaps in development. This provides education to the future leaders of the organization, with some of these discussions focusing on prevention of sexual harassment, sexual assault, understanding their roles and responsibilities, ethical decision-making, suicide prevention, and many topics that are outside the scope of traditional military education and training. 
As April is Sexual Assault Awareness Prevention Month, month, we do a number of events to highlight our focus on this year's theme of Step Forward, Prevent, and Advocate. And Ms. Sorrell will provide additional details on the program she has in place. And last year, I was asked to serve as the Vice Chair of the National Joint Diversity Executive Council, working with the 10 regional councils and the National Guard Bureau Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the sharing of best practices, drafting policy, and improving diversity across the National Guard. So I'd like to conclude my comments for now, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to provide Ms. Sorrell the opportunity uh, to provide you information on the annual report on sexual harassment and sexual assault. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Nikki Sorrell. I am the Joint Force Headquarters Sexual Assault Response Coordinator. Um, I'm going to be walking us through this year's fiscal year or 2021's fiscal year annual report. If at any point anyone has questions, do feel free to <laughs> jump in and ask them. <clears throat> I am the first civilian to author this report, and the gravity of that was felt the moment the task was put in front of me. Um, I don't speak military language, and though I've come to understand a lot of it, um, I felt it really important that, that this report clearly refre reflect what it is we're doing in regard in regards to sexual violence, um, because we are doing really good work, and I didn't want any of that to get lost in translation. The report is still divided into the four main areas, so sexual assault, sexual harassment, uh, there's a newly added SAPR office strategic plan, and then there's the addendum section. So that'll include the FY21 gender report, a policies and definitions uh, portion that pertains to all sexual assault and harassment. And then there's also an acronym guide too. Though I plan to avoid most acronyms, it is there just in case. Um, we will mostly focus on section one, two, and three, and the addendum will be discussed as needed. I think General Knight hit a lot of the, the gender report points. Um, so we may not need to, but it is there. <clears throat> So at the bottom of the executive summary page on page one are our incident numbers. You'll see that in fiscal year 21, the SAPR office, so that's the Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office, uh, we tracked five reports of sexual assault. Three reports in which occurred during fiscal year 21 and two that occurred in previous fiscal years. All the accused subjects in these cases were Vermont National Guard members. The survivors involved, four of them were Vermont Guard members, and one of them was a civilian survivor. Not stated in the executive summary, but in the section specific to federalized reports, it is noted that our office began tracking an additional sexual assault report at the close of the fiscal year. So that incident did occur in FY21, and it was reported while the survivor, who was a Vermont Guard member, was on active duty status outside of the U.S. Um, the Accused is also a Vermont Guard, Vermont Guard member, and that case is currently going through a courts martial with the active duty army as we speak. The survivor is home and she's being supported through our office. The Equal Opportunity and Diversity Office, known in-house as the EO office, processes reports of sexual harassment and discrimination based on sexual orientation. In FY21, the office received <laughs> zero reports. We believe that that reporting is not indicative of actual events, and because of that, the office has changed the policies associated with the reporting procedures. These changes have already begun to build trust and have gained traction in FY22. Um, General Knight really did a, a great job at summing up a lot of the highlights portions of this report. So we're going to move past that and jump into section one. As stated above, the SAPR office receives a sexual assault reports. Uh, we define sexual assault as intentional sexual conduct characterized by use of force, threats, intimidation, or abuse of authority when the survivor does not or cannot consent. This does include rape, sexual assault, aggravated sexual contact, abusive sexual contact, forcible sodomy, and attempts to commit these acts. Currently, the SAPR office is staffed by myself, the Joint Force Headquarters Sexual Assault Response Coordinator. That is a mouthful, so we do use the uh, acronym SARC for our, that role. Um, at the wing, our Air Force side of the house, we have Miss Serena Fernari in, in yellow back there. She is the wing SARC. <clears throat> and starting next week, very excited for this, we're going to be onboarding a new victim advocate coordinator. So her name is Natasha, and similar to Serena and I, uh, she is a civilian and her background is in mental health. She also has a graduate degree in social work. 
Uh, she will have oversight of the pool of victim advocates on the Army side of the House. So that is a group of about 30 members who are all specially trained in our reporting procedures and who receive continuing education around trauma awareness and survivor support. In regards to reporting options, <clears throat> when a survivor comes forward, they get to choose between uh, a restricted report or an unrestricted report. Regardless of which report they choose, they will still get access to mental health counseling, as well as medical, legal, and advocacy services. The main difference between the two options is that restricted reports remain confidential and unrestricted reports involve an investigation. So please just note that at the Guard, we do not have jurisdiction over civilian or criminal crimes of sexual assault. Uh, so as a result, all of our unrestricted reports are always reported to local law enforcement. If the incident doesn't get investigated through local law enforcement, the Adjutant General will then request the Office of Complex Investigations from the National Guard Bureau to come and investigate. And th those are a, uh, the select team of specially trained individuals uh, that investigate only sexual assaults at all the National Guard um, states. Their findings cannot result in a criminal action, but they, do, they can and do result in administrative action. There's also a subcategory for our uh, reporting. Uh, so if we, don't, if, if we do not have a survivor present to file a report with us, we will open something called an, an open with limited report. And again, so that's when we don't have a survivor president present. Uh, perhaps it's a military offender that has um, assaulted a civilian victim, or it's a third party who comes forward to report to their command that they know about an assault. On page six of the report, <clears throat> you'll find a few charts that break down this year and prior year incidents. On figure 1.1, we can see the five reports broken down by type, um, by uh, report type, excuse me, offense. <laughs> so you can see that there were zero restricted reports this year. There were two unrestricted and we had three open with limited reports. Figure 1.2 shows the total reports of sexual assaults the Sapper office has received since its inception in FY10. Uh, the red circle, so that's gonna indicate that the perpetrator involved was a Vermont National Guard member. Figure 1.3 shows the total number of reports received by the Sapper office, and that's broken out by the fiscal year that the assaults occurred. <clears throat> On page eight, there are two charts there. The first is a breakdown of our reports with case details. The second is a disposition information on the accused members. So that's sort of a snapshot of what was happening to the accused or with the case at the time that this report was written. Of note from chart one is that we had two male survivors this year. One of those males declined to be involved in the process and that is his right and we respect that. The other member who reported the incident uh, the other member was someone who reported an incident that happened 15 years ago. I choose here to highlight the males because these are the cases that st statistically do not get reported in the military. And the fact that that does feels very meaningful. Chart two, the dispositions. Um, <clears throat> these are the same cases as above. Uh, case five, you'll see at the top of page nine. Of note here is that three out of our five cases are currently going through the civilian process. So two are in the court systems now, and one is being investigated. The cases not involved in the civilian process um, have and are being worked through. The case that involved the survivor member who did not want to participate still concluded with the perpetrator facing administrative action. He resigned from his full-time job, and he was separated from, from being a drilling member of the Guard. Uh, in case 00469, <clears throat> that was the incident that occurred 15 years ago. This case just recently, last week actually, um, was investigated by our Office of Complex Investigation. The military has no statute of limitations on sexual assaults. So though our local law enforcement couldn't pick this case up, we were able to. And what I'm really compelled to share with you all here is that the ability uh, for this person to be able to report and for it to be investiga investigated holds a lot of value for someone who has carried that with them for that long. Yes, yes Representative Quillen. Um, in that one, I, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand this, but the subject is no longer with 
Front National Guard. He's now at the Air Force Reserves. Yes. So once the person leaves the Guard, are they not under your jurisdiction anymore? Or, or what does that mean? So I'll, I'll throw that to Major Kafferlin for the legal side of it. Absolutely. So the, if the person is under the command and control of a different organization, either a different reserve component, a different National Guard, or even an active component of the U.S. military, it would be up to them to uh, be able to decide on any action that would take in as far as disciplinary action that would not be under the province of the Vermont National Guard. So was, it, was this incident started to be investigated by our National Guard and then this person left our Guard? So this case, the survivor involved is still a Vermont National Guard member. The perpetrator is not. The account happened when both were Vermont Guard members 15 years ago. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, of course. On page nine, we have our federalized reports. So this is when a member on active duty status reports a sexual assault. As I stated above, I did receive word of a report at the very end of the FY, and at the time I had no case details. Since then, um, we've learned a lot more, and the survivor is now home. She's set up with a victim advocate. I speak with her regularly, and she also has an excellent special victims counsel that is supporting her as her case, case goes through a courts martial. So a special victims counsel is a military lawyer, and that is someone specific to working with our sexual assault survivors. The perpetrator is now being held on an active duty base outside of the U.S. <clears throat> so now we'll move. Yeah. So when you say being held, does that mean in custody, not on duty? He is not on duty. And it, they are in, in custody, meaning like in a in a jail of some sort. So again, pass that to Major Catherine for the legal component. <laughs> that's that's within the discretion of the of that command. Okay. They, there's various things they can do. They can restrict them to quarters. quarters they can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have them work in whatever shop so they're being useful to okay. I don't know, do the trash or the recycling. So there's various, <laughs> uh, very various uh, things they can do with that person okay. uh, in the interim. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will always go to legal regardless, <laughs> but our office specifically, we are built to support our survivors. So while we get information on our perpetrators, I, I can't always answer those okay. questions. So <laughs> thank you. Major Kaplan's here for us. <clears throat> So now we're going to move into the sexual harassment portion um, that starts on page nine. May I ask a question before we start a new section? Um, General Knight, you said you can't can't help people situations where they're not reported. And you said we're certain that there were more by statistical value, there's more incidents that are reported. And I guess the question I have, especially when it comes to sexual assault, but it'll play out for sexual harassment too, is the feeling of um, safety. Um, we're learning through this process over the years um, that it's really difficult under a sexual harassment case to come forward. And the numbers here have stayed roughly the same. They're going down a little bit. I'm just curious to know, are you, and I guess it's only anecdotal because the official numbers are here. Um, <clears throat> do you feel like the system that's been set up can accommodate the safety that people feel like they need through the victim advocates through um, in order to come out and say, I mean, 15 years for this person, that's not uncommon in the rest of the world either. So I'm just curious to know, like, how do you, how do you address something that is, um, it's almost a catch 22. You can't work on it unless it's reported, but if people don't feel comfortable about reporting, where are, where does that leave us? And it's for it is a very, it can be a, a very nasty cycle, which is why I think some of these issues remain in our organization. Um, the solution to me is building trust and confidence in our process, however complex and clumsy it may be. Uh, it takes time and it works, um, but we have to have that information. The trust piece, again, as I mentioned in my testimony, comes back to the professional development and making sure that, that uh, our rising leaders understand what their responsibilities are. Um, and then Mr. Jamison can speak a little bit to, to his experience as our state equal employment manager. I know that there are instance, instant, incidents that occur, and I know that the proper action was taken. I also know it wasn't reported. Our, our goal is to eliminate it as quickly as possible at the lowest level as soon as it happens, which is as it should be. Well, I want all of our folks to feel that they have 
that ability to be that candid with somebody if they're being unprofessional. That's the easy answer. <clears throat> but when you have something which is a crime of violence and power and control, um, such as sexual assault, that's a, a very challenging thing to do to come forward. Thus, our, our import, the importance of having what we have here with our response capability, but also the importance of getting after that prevention piece and having a violence prevention workforce that can help educate the force and eliminate those behaviors. Because Mr. Chair, that's what we're trying to do. Unfortunately, it's one real weekend at a time is change <laughs> behaviors. And that's simply gonna take time. But I, I do believe we'll, we will do that. Um, some of it generationally, we'll certainly get a time out of it. Um, but we have to keep trying. Duffy, any, any, your perspective on, on reporting of sexual harassment? I, I can speak to the sexual harassment piece, but not the sexual assault piece. And, and um, one of the things I, you know, I'm concerned about when I look at the numbers and I'm not seeing that the sexual harassment, you know, there's, we didn't have a, a reported case uh, the last fiscal year. Uh, to me that, you know, raises some questions about, you know, is it really likely that nobody experienced any kind of sexual assault or sexual harassment? I would say, no, that's probably not the case. And so it makes you look inward to see if people are comfortable in, in making the report. So. Uh, this last year, we did a, a focus on what I call working on the infrastructure, uh, which is creating policies uh, that uh, I think make the process a lot more accessible. It's very clear um, and pr providing multiple opportunities for uh, people to report. Um, General Knight spoke about handling things at the lowest level, and that's always that's a good thing. But we also wanted to give people opportunities to report other places. People can report directly to General Knight. They can report to me. They can report to their commander. They can report to, we have a network of people or uh, uh, equal opportunity leaders uh, and, and then equal opportunity advisors. So that was very important to me to see that we, uh, even though that structure was in place, that people knew that there are a lot of opportunities to report. Um, and it's not simply about creating those policies, it's about disseminating those policies. And so uh, there's been, a, we've been taking a lot of steps in that direction. Um, I kind of half jokingly call it the reach up tour, uh, meaning that we have this app on, on, the, um, on people that you can access on your phone that where you can report, but you have to know about that. And so we're going to the installations, we're talking to folks. Um, I had an opportunity uh, just last week uh, to, to talk to uh, uh, commanders about the new um, standard operating procedure for equal opportunity and uh, you know, letting them know, you know, hey, we have this new pol policy that clarifies what your responsibilities are. The last thing I'll say about it, I know it's, is that, um, you know, when I look at uh, policy, sometimes I gulp because or in this case, the, the policy that this, the standard operating procedure that we just issued is 26 pages long. And um, you, you cannot, people cannot really digest that kind of information. So what I did was I created uh, one page information sheets that, it, that makes it very, straightforward what people's responsibilities are. I think that's what you do. I think, you know, it's, it's those, it's those uh, small steps to, you know, have that infrastructure in place. You have to, as General Knight mentioned, and then build the trust. You know, um, you have to let people know that we have this policy and, and um, have them feel that they're comfortable in reporting to us and then uh, then let us let's work the policy. Let's let's uh, take the action. Let people see that yes, you know things are happening. My I'm anticipating uh, when we're back next year, you're going to see that there's going to be reports, and uh, and and hopefully you'll interpret it the way I interpret it, which is actually a good thing, mm -hmm. meaning that you know people you know they we are building that trust. So. That's the harassment piece. Uh, Simple little question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so 
Duffy and uh, General Knight really spoke to what we're getting into in the next section. So, but I'll still touch on it here. So, um, <clears throat> as I stated above, allegations of sexual harassment are going to go through our EO office that is um, managed by Mr. Duffy Jameson. Uh, the program does have three reporting options. So, uh, an informal resolution request. So that is a that is when a report comes in and it gets reviewed and investigated internally. So inside of the Vermont Guard. There's a formal resolution request, and that's when a report will come in again. Uh, it gets reviewed um, and investigated through the National Guard Bureau. And then there is also an anonymous reporting option. One of the really great changes to the policy which Duffy spoke to is that the program now allows soldiers and airmen to report an incident to any leader or support member around them. So you no longer have to directly go through your chain of command. You don't have to go to your unit's equal opportunity rep. Um, you can go to someone who you really trust with that information. As he said, you can go right to General Knight if you'd like. Um, and that really gives the member choice, um, which I think is always important. Uh, but also, you know, if for some reason they don't necessarily trust their chain of command or their equal opportunity leaders with around them, they can go outside of that. And there's no um, problem with that. <clears throat> sure. <Represent. clears throat> have, have you had kind of informal groups with with members to ask why there's if the general is saying he assumes it is happening but there's no report is there an informal way to talk to the guard members to say is this in our culture and why aren't people stepping forward or what could make it easier i because it may be top-down policies 26 pages it might just be too much yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have those conversations pretty regularly. I know myself and Duffy get out to the units a lot. Um, and yes, so short answer is yes. Thank you. And, and Representative Kalaki, that's something I've been messaging since I've been in this job. I mean, just don't have any tolerance for it. Uh, no patience for it. It's not a part of this organization. And if you can't align with that, then it's probably better that you find something else to do. Um, but to give you an example of, of the levels of engagement, and again, starting on page 10, but page 11, page 12, all the, the numbers of, of initiatives um, that Nikki and her team have undertaken, both here and at the national level, uh, based on those lines of effort, um, it, it's a, a constant theme and a message throughout this organization. And, and I'll tell you, sir, there are things that are transparent to you that I see. Um, I see email discussions with, with young company commanders unsolicited by me, I didn't initiate it, talking about these very things and how they want to eliminate it. That's the future of the Guard. Um, we're a human endeavor. We're going to make bad choices. Our job is to make sure that that's probably the most painful thing that they experience. And if it impacts their career, they'll think twice before they do it again. If it's egregious enough, they can't be a part of the organization. So uh, I think this question is for you, Duffy. Um, okay. Does the, the guard or the military have its own definition of harassment? And um, where is the, where does the protocol for adjudicating these complaints come from? Are they in your um, rules of order or uh, how does that all come about? Can you answer that? Um, so the, the definition that's used is the is the legal definition okay. that you I was wondering, yes. yes. Yeah. And um, so so the way I like to simplify the process is to talk about it as when a person wants a case adjudicated, they file internally, or that's the informal complaint. And the focus of that internal process where the organization handles it first is to see if we can come up with an agreeable resolution. Okay. If that resolution is not agreeable, then the person can um, opt to have it go external, go to the National Guard Bureau, and then that's when the adjudication phase will okay. kick in. No, thank you, that explains it, yep. I just wanted to highlight the import of, of the fact that it can be reported to anybody. I think that that's something that we <laughs> saw over the years was the issue that you had to report to your next level who could very well be the person that had done it or was good buddies with or whatever. And so I just think that, you know, that shouldn't be glossed over. What a, what a real achievement that is to be able to say, you can report this incident to, to anyone that can bring it forward with you. But Absolutely. It's a, huge, it's a huge shift and thank you because I know that the chain of command is so important. And so I know that it, how, do, how do you 
keep that balance, but still make this effective. Yeah, absolutely. And nationally, that is something that the program itself will be going to, but we have, we are front runners in that. And that feels yeah, yeah. really worth, worth highlighting. So thank you for that. <clears throat> so um, if everybody's ready, we can look at section three. So that's the office, the SAPR office strategic plan. So the sexual assault prevention response office strategic plan. <clears throat> it starts on page 10. And this plan, um, it came about at the time as actually a tool for, for me to visualize what it was that Serena and I were doing. Um, in the military, there's a, a focus on logistics. And this is sort of that. Um, <clears throat> I would say it's a fuse between program philosophy and our overall efforts. And it helps us and all of you really see what we're doing and sort of see where we're planning to go with all of this. Um, you'll notice that it starts with a line of effort and then we have action steps followed by um, a table full of campaigns, events and things that we have done that align with that specific um, line of effort. Line of effort one, <clears throat> work to create a culture that allows all members to feel connected, respected and valued. Um, action steps that we take to achieve that. We really focus on offering education and events that all members um, have, that all members and to give all members, excuse me, resources and information that give them the tools that prevent, uh, that promote well being, um, self awareness, emotional intelligence, and a general feeling of connectedness. We conduct specialized educational briefs and group discussions. And then we also, also offer specialized trainings for leadership and also our service members who have more of an authorita authoritative role. So our victim advocates per se, or um, I am in the midst, just executed my first one last week of giving a specialized training to all of leaders down to squad level. Um, and that is a training based on a lot of the changes that the SAPR program has made in the last year, but specifically with a real focus on retaliation as well. So we won't go over the whole chart because there's a lot there. Um, a few highlights I like to pinpoint. I think uh, both Duffy and General Knight spoke about the reach up tour. Uh, that's been a really fun thing to do and just a nice avenue to offer people a confidential and if they want to anonymous way to report. Um, we had Obi West come to speak to our members. And if you're not familiar with him, I highly recommend Googling him, finding him on social media. He, he's really incredible and, and it's worth checking him out to see what he does. Um, Obi is an advocate and an activist, and he uses spoken word poetry as his platform to educate and talk to people. He is actually a retired uh, warrant officer from the military. He's been retired for, for 15 years now. It's been a while. Um, but he came to us, he led two 90 minute discussions based on sexual violence, male victimization and the importance of survivor support. And he did that by speaking a poem and then he would hold a discussion around that topic. Um, it was really powerful, it was really engaging. And I think everybody that came up to Serena and I after were just like, yeah, that was, that was really great. Um, can we do that again? And we said, yeah, when there's more money for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what's important to note here is, is the two folks that are listed here, uh, uh, Obi West and, and Anna Nassett. Um, I, we share that. I don't sit on good ideas. I, I shared this with my counterpart in Nevada and other states. Um, in my view, what, what Nikki and Serena and our team are doing here are leading Guard Nation. Uh, and that's been exemplified at the national level. These are just two examples of that. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, it was uh, General Knight spoke about it briefly, was our SAPM campaign last year. So April is Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month, SAPM, of course we all have our acronym. <laughs> um, and last year we did a bunch of stuff. Uh, excuse me, my allergies. <clears throat> the nicer weather is coming out. And it's, oh. allergies, it's terrible. <laughs> um, last year we did a bunch of stuff in my opinion i think the best thing we did was that we asked our members to take a pledge to believe and support survivors um at this point major detweiler was supposed to show you all a copy of that pledge but he forgot it <laughs> call you right out so. <laughs> um, but we have this really lovely pledge in teal which is our color um, and we put it on eight by tens and it said you know i will believe in support survivors who come forward to report sexual assault and individuals from both air and army signed them i mean we had 
a few hundreds. It was it was a really, really wonderful showing. Um, we had them posted all over the air in the Army buildings. Some of our units had asked for really large. Um, I, I, we printed out really large ones for them and the whole unit would sign. Um, that was a really powerful thing that we all did. Um, we called it the I Believe campaign, and it gave Serena and I the ability to go out and talk to members about what it really means to support each other. And it also gave us the chance to talk about false reporting, which has such a has a false narrative around it. And to be able to tackle that head on and ask those, answer some of those questions um, was a really meaningful time, way to spend last April. We are, of course, in April again. And this year we're building off of that theme of I believe with the theme of step forward, prevent and advocate. We're focusing on a heavy social media campaign right now, and that runs from this week to the third week in the, of the month. Um, we're focusing on one, one portion of that theme each week. So this week we are looking all at stepping forward and what does that mean and what does that look, at, look like? Um, the last week of the month we're going to be doing some some of our events that we like to do. We have a wellness event that's always a really big hit. We have arts and crafts going on. We have a yoga instructor that comes in. Um, we started a hike last year, so it's only the second annual, but I'm gonna stick with the, the annual thing and it's gonna be a, a regular. Um, we'll do a hike at the end of the month and then we're all gonna be wearing uh, jeans on Denim Day, which is a national sexual assault awareness campaign. And that's on April 27th. Line of effort two, we work to shift the response-based nature of the SAPR program to incorporate primary prevention as a model. Um, when I started in the office, so I've been with the office two and a half years now, I started as the advocate coordinator and uh, my passion was prevention. Um, and so that is really what I wanted to focus things on. I was told at the time, um, you know, these are the specific tasks, but also like go where your heart leads you. And so that's that's some of the, the doors we started knocking on was that prevention piece. Now, I think we're really lucky that the, the national lens is also has moved there. So we've joined um, a national working group uh, where we are working on rolling out a prevention-based workforce. Um, we also help uh, facilitate discussions and I've conducted a lot of specialized trainings to focus on um, healthy relationships, focus on that bystander intervention, and building emotional intelligence. So those are some of the uh, proven um, <clears throat> mechanisms for prevention of sexual violence. General, I did speak briefly about it. Um, <laughs> And it's something that we're incredibly excited about at the Guard. We've been selected as, as one of the few Guard states to pilot the prevention workforce. So this is a program structured to support our force in four main prevention areas. That's sexual assault, domestic violence, interpersonal violence, and suicide prevention. And the program is something that all branches of the military will have in the next five to seven years. But we've been able, we will be the one of the first to have this. And um, we're getting that because we've made it really clear to our national folks that we're passionate about prevention and that as a state, we're really ready and we're capable of implementing this. So more to come on that, um, but definitely something we're really excited about. Can I just, of course. Are we can blow? <clears throat> um, in terms, this is, I know, um, a, side, a side issue, but suicide prevention, what is, um, what is the rate of suicide in the National Guard U.S., but then in, in Vermont? How much of a problem do you perceive it to be? Health statistics. On we can get the statistics for you, ma'am. It's, it's been a problem. Um, I think that it maintains a consistent uh, rate every year. I lost uh, Airman Liam McKelvey and Staff Sergeant Jordan Snow on the same day to suicide. One Army, one Air. Uh, that's just one example. Um, it's there. I'm on the suicide prevention uh, task force at the National Guard level. Um, we've completely revised that policy as well. That should be forthcoming. Uh, and other things that we're doing it, outside the traditional approach of mandatory training, ask, care, escort, all those are great. Um, the bigger issue is what are we doing to get resources into the hands of those who need it? If I look across Vermont, we simply don't have enough behavioral health specialists, those brain health specialists that focus on PTSD, anxiety, adjustment disorder within our military. 
uh, probably I, I would say one or two, maybe if they're in the TRICARE network are actually taking new patients and that's simply inadequate. So knowing that uh, we've worked with PTSD now um, with the, and we've got a uh, part of that is, is Operation Purple Resolve. In two weeks, I'll be there going through their training. Um, it's a new and revised resiliency train the trainer program that will bring a whole host of different resources and educational opportunities for our members. It's, it's more of the take care of your buddy approach early on. And then the other part of that um, is the Cohen Network, where we have out of state behavioral health specialists actually doing telehealth with our members, free of cost to us. So not a perfect solution, but it's certainly more than we had a year ago. Mm -hmm. But we'll get those statistics for you. I think we've probably pulled Thanks. both national and, and what's happening within Vermont. Thanks. I think the national numbers have stayed roughly 22 to 23. That's correct. Soldiers a day or veterans. Yes. Veterans a day. Okay. Yep. Per, per day, right, nationally. Thank you. <clears throat> Line of effort plan is providing survivors of sexual assault support and resources that are holistic, individualized, and that incorporate both military and community-based connections. So we do this through conversations with our survivors to understand what it is that they're looking for from our program. Uh, we give them choice. We lay out the options um, and we let them take control. I say this in I believe now every training that I give, and that's um, when somebody is assaulted, choice has been taken from them, control has been taken from them. And uh, Serena and I really view our office as the place where they get to get, take that back. Uh, we're gonna offer them everything uh, that we have to offer them. And if they don't wanna take any of it, if they wanna take bits of it, we support them in, in those choices. Um, the office, <clears throat> We'll also meet the holistic needs by connecting members with mental health professionals, advocates, legal guidance, and medical attention through both military community and our state resources. So um, again, coming back to anything that survivor is looking for, we, we work really hard to get them. The line of effort, um, line of effort three is not new to our office. Um, it's definitely a staple of our program, but I put it in here because it's something that we should always be coming back to. Survivor support is our bedrock and it deserves constant evaluation and commitment. We've recently reestablished our relationship with the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence to help bring the community resources to our members. Um, that's already been a, a really fulfilling relationship. Uh, we have uh, Kelly Prescott coming to, to talk with our advocates in May actually. Um, so that's really exciting. And Serena and I also bring that community piece as well. Uh, we, you know, we're both civilians, no military time. Uh, we've both uh, practiced as private therapists, um, and we have a lot of years of experience in the mental health field. So that concludes this year's report. <laughs> um, I will pass it back to General Knight for closing, but thanks for, thanks for listening. Representative we've got a few questions before closing, I think, Representative Kalaki. Um, when you were in... Line of effort one you mentioned false reporting, and I don't actually know what that means, like in, in your scope of what you're doing. Yeah. So a lot of times when we, uh, you know, when we say, you know, just believe and support survivors, sometimes the response to that has been, well, I don't know the situation. What if I, what if I don't know? What if I don't, um, I can't believe them. What if it is fake? You know, somebody knows somebody. Um, is, is tends to be a conversation that we hear. And so we took the, that, um, that space to have the conversation around what false reporting actually looks like, which national numbers say that about 2% of reports are actually false. And <clears throat> so that being said, 98% of reports are not false. But then we also take what we know in that only about one in five people do report their sexual assaults too. So just sort of looking at those numbers and offering members those numbers, and that gives them the space to be like, okay, I can just believe what's in front of me um, and not just jump to conclusions or. Okay, thank you. Just jump in for one second. Yeah, of course. And then the difference between false reporting and something called unsubstantiated. So false would be, I, I, I accuse somebody who did not do this thing versus unsubstantiated, which is a lot of, um, sometimes it comes back as meaning they're, the evidence wasn't there or, or whatnot, I would say. Yeah. 
So the false reporting is it did not happen. And that is actually a very small percentage. Okay, thanks. Nikki, you've mentioned this in general light. I'm not sure who this is really for, but you mentioned that you're not military. Serena is not military. Um, previous folks in your position have been military, um, but perhaps at a lieutenant rank or what have you in lieutenant rank. Um, and I'm just curious to know your experiences as civilians in the middle of a military um, organization where um, our concerns in the past have always been, well, if it, because everything is set up in a hierarchy, what would a lieutenant have to say to a major under these circumstances? And, and especially a power dynamic there, yep. never mind in an assault related situation. I'm just curious to know, you feel it sounds like it's a new, a new situation, but um, is this something that you feel is actually helpful? Because again, military people tend to only want to talk to military people. That's the stereotype. Um, curious to know how you are managing the fact that there may be some form of, of um, I guess, trust building that must have to go on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I Yes, I think there is a component of trust building. Um, and that's why, you know, I think in the beginning, I even said, like, I don't speak military language, but I've learned some, you know, I do try to assimilate in that way to help build that trust. Um, and I also think being a civilian in this position, uh, like anything, I mean, we respect rank, uh, but it doesn't always, um, it's not going to affect some of the questions we might ask, you know? And we can't, I can't necessarily say that, that that's been the case for other people, but we know that that's just flat out not a case for us. And, and that feels comfortable, I guess, if that's the right word. And, and Duffy? Um, I've never worn the uniform. Uh, so I'm also a civilian. I don't speak the language. Um, I, my experience has been that it has been probably more an advantage than a disadvantage to be a civilian. I, I, I actually think that people tend to open up a little bit easier with me than perhaps maybe someone who's military. Maybe it's because I'm I'm bumbling through you know the whole military process and they they're eager to to educate me and I'm very inquisitive you know because I don't know and I want them to to help me understand and so I, I think of it as an advantage. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of traffic now and I'm talking to a lot of folks and I'm making a lot of good connections. And uh, so I think it's, it's helped. I, I will say that, um, you know, compared to my prior experience, I'm an attorney and I actually litigated cases in dealing with sexual harassment. Now, this job is hard. It's, it's a hard job. It's hard to be proactive. It's hard to prevent something from happening. It's a lot easier <laughs> in my other capacity to, um, you know, be the one who's saying somebody did something wrong and and, and showing them that that way. Um, so I enjoy that challenge, and uh, to do that, I think you have to you ha it has to be it has to come from the organization itself. And I'm feeling that we're 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 doing that. We're we're making those strides. And any difference in the communications between part-timers and full-timers? I mean, difference other than, you know, it is a constant effort to make sure we're getting our, our part-time folks, right? And, and making sure that uh, we're taking those extra steps that we're going out to units, which we've been doing. And, um, you know, technically, Duffy and I, we don't have to work the weekends, but we certainly do. You know, we work those drill weekends because um, that feels like, a meaningful way. It is the way to connect with all of our folks. Yes. So, and General, I, um, you're, you're very open to this committee in the four years I've served, and I certainly appreciate that. But um, I've heard many CEOs say they have an open door policy and their employees don't believe them. So they don't actually come. I'm just wondering, as you've done this work, have you seen an uptick in people actually walking into your office and saying, do you have a moment that I could talk to? Well, sir, it's happened probably about a half a dozen times in a little over three years. 
um, that I've been in the job. Uh, probably more important is between uh, my senior enlisted advisor, both Air and Army, um, my general officers, uh, both Air and Army, and myself going and as as Nikki pointed out, actually doing unit, unit visitations. Uh, that circulation is important. And there are times I've had conversations. I don't want leadership in the room. I want to talk to the members of the guard that are doing the work and, and kind of gauge their sense of things. Uh, the other important thing to note is I have um, an inspector general. Um, that's a Title 10 officer. While she works for me, I, her reporting is to me. Um, and she's really the censor for the organization. Um, people may report to her anonymously. Um, so that really is an extension of the open door policy. <clears throat> I've had folks come in and they've had issues that they didn't feel comfortable briefing their chain of command. That's perfectly fine. I want to know. But I will always ask one question when we're done sharing information is, what do you want me to do about it? And the answer normally is, well, nothing. I just wanted you to know. So that's hard. If I can't, if you're not going to put your name on it, and if, if I'm telling you it's egregious enough, I can take action. I understand. I know. And it's frustrating for me to have that information. And I'm not going to violate that confidence and trust, whether it's a sexual assault survivor or somebody who's having to work through a personality conflict. So it's tough. But in a corporation, if the supervisor knows of harassment, Aren't they legally bound to do something? Harassment would be a different conversation. I would immediately go. Okay, to, got, it, yeah. got it. I understand that. Thank yeah. you. And I wasn't actually questioning you. I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah. how you answer that right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this is very helpful to hear. Um, not on Zoom. Um, <laughs> I am. I am wondering how. Um, how you communicate to, you know, so there are these five, you know, cases. Um, who knows about the results of a particular um, case or investigation? Who is told the information? <clears throat> and I'm and I'm wondering um, because because I you know without understanding that something has happened. Um, um, then uh, there has been some resolution, um, then it, it, it just makes it much harder to encourage people to bring forward a charge. So, ma'am, and that's what I was referring to uh, when I went through my uh, comments. It's the status of discipline. So, historically, we have never published. Um, how our incidents were adjudicated, whether somebody lost rank, whether they were discharged, whether there was a loss of pay, a letter of reprimand, whatever happened. Um, and that's for both civil violations and violations of our policy regulation in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So we've changed that. Uh, that was, I, I heard, I was listening. Um, it was a contentious issue for a little while because folks, well, you know, right to privacy and all that. So I get it. Read day in court lately. So you violated the rules, you committed an act, you're accountable. So we'll redact it to a degree to protect the perpetrator's specific identity, but we also publish what happened, irrespective of rank, enlisted and officer, and we do that quarterly. Uh, for me, that sh and we gave it a test run um, this past quarter, I sent it out to the leadership team Get this to your subordinate commanders and to your command teams, because to your point, I want every member of this organization to be able to look at that. You go, oh, well, I guess something happened. Um, there is some risk because, and as, as Major Kaffler would tell you, every case is adjudicated based on its own merits, its own, its own facts and circumstances. So what one person receives as a penalty for on the face of it, what looks like a similar violation, there are some subtleties there that simply mean the outcome, how it's adjudicated is different. And that's fine. I would rather have that than, than have them living um, kind of in a vacuum and not knowing that, yes, there actually is action taken. Representative Lawson. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, I'm looking up your uh, sexual assault case details chart on page eight. 
And a question occurred to me, uh, I was looking at the ranks of both the perpetrators and the victims. And I'm, I'm just wondering, are you seeing any kind of general generational differences? Because we have a mix here. Obviously, some of these people have been serving for a while mm -hmm. and others not so long. So I, are you seeing something different in a younger generation? You know, it's interesting because nationally, the numbers are saying that it is in that 18 to 24 range, whereas we're, we're still just seeing a bit of a spectrum. And we're not necessarily finding that here in Vermont. So it seems to be spread pretty It does, quickly. yeah. Absolutely. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yes, am I, would it be OK for me to, to address the gender report? Sure. At this point. So um, I just want to make sure that I understand um, because um, <clears throat> General and I have talked about the issue of recruitment um, years back. Um, and so <clears throat> if I look on page 14 at figure 4.1, um, Montier <clears throat> um, Army National Guard representation, the percentage of uh, male to female has remained constant um, Wow. And I then, but if I look at then figure 4.2, um, <clears throat> it, it looks like 22% uh, of the new recruits are women, but that is perspective, right? That they have, they are not actually counted in that 2021 figure of 14%. Are these two, I, I'm just trying to understand where the difference is, 14% versus 22%. Um, and I guess my broader question is, you know, I, I know from our conversations that that's not where you wanna be, um, that ratio. Um, and I, I mean, I think that the, the statistics in terms of women in leadership positions, they're, that's very encouraging. Um, and I know that you've made a, a, a big effort to do that. And I'm just wondering if, um, <clears throat> how concerned you are about how flat this line is given the uh, energy that you've put into uh, recruitment and how to understand that last. I'll have to look into that one myself. I am not a math person, but I do know that the increase mm -hmm. is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so of all overall, recruits, in overall recruits, were. Um, how that <clears throat> applies to the overall percentage within the guard. I, I'm wondering if there isn't a crossover of that not making the transition into the pie chart. We'll find out for, for you, ma'am. If I may. Go ahead, Doug. Um, so the, the, the figure 4.1 represents the overall representation yeah. versus <laughs> any one incoming class. Right. So what you're looking at for this one incoming class, they saw 21% of the total amount of recruits is 21%. And how does that compare? 22%. It says an FY, so it so there yeah. was a big boost. Yep, fourteen percent. Yeah, 20, I mean probably raw data though. We're not probably seeing. I, I don't have the raw yep. data here, okay. but you're probably not talking. You know, a yep. you know, a lot of numbers. You know, yep. when you get down to the raw data itself, but the percentage wise of the class that came in, twenty two percent of them were women this, mm -hmm. this this round this this fiscal year. So, ma'am, there are a number of variables that are uh, impacting recruiting right now. Um, as we discussed earlier, one of them is actually um, building and sustaining our lines of effort. Uh, I would call it a campaign plan that actually goes beyond me. Uh, my direction to our folks, uh, my strategic planner and the staff was don't build it based on my personality, build it on something that lasts in the organization. So whoever departs an office who owns that that line of effort, who has the rose pinned on them, you own it. Whoever comes in behind them now picks it up and we're better able to sustain it. We're simply not leveraging um, all of the centers of influence that we have to reflect the opportunities that we have in the organization. Um, that would in turn help me grow, help us grow um, gender opportunity in the guard. I know we can do it, mm -hmm. uh, but until we can align this, this body, um, the Vermont Commission on Women, um, all of our business and education leaders, all the centers of influence that we all know exist in this state. And we should be 
one of the first options for those who have an interest in serving. For my closing, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so as discussed, I've, I've made addressing sexual harassment, sexual assault, and sometimes simply poor treatment of others a priority since I've been in this job. I would also share with you that would be true whether I'm required to report to this legislature or not. I understand there's more to be done and our efforts will certainly transcend my time in this office. I'd also be remiss to not acknowledge the incredible talent we have on our team, our full-time Title V federal technicians, Ms. Sorrell, Ms. Frenari, Mr. Jamison. Um, really not enough time today to recognize the entire team, as Nikki had mentioned, the victim advocates, our equal, equal opportunity leaders and advisors, our behavioral health specialists. Um, I lean on them uh, quite a bit. I value their experience, their innovation, certainly. They allow me to be the voice for our guard on the national stage. It is, I've uh, said it before, it's less about me. It's more about their efforts. Um, they're making a difference. Uh, but that diligence in making our guard better in turn makes guard nation better. Um, and for me, Vermont remains an example for the rest uh, of our National Guard, both Air and Army. But also note if it's of interest uh, to the committee, I know you have a lot going on during the session. I understand it. I'm certainly not gonna send you all of our policies that are updated, uh, but again, in the interest of transparency, um, if you go to the Vermont National Guard public website, you will find a number of our policies, specifically the human resource policies, the ones that Duffy had mentioned. I think he's done remarkable work taking, for instance, a 26-page standing operating procedure and boiling it down to a one-page, here's what you need to do, Commander. Um, so those are valuable for us. Uh, and again, it helps with communication and, and uh, makes us a better organization. Uh, we're better than we were. And that, will, that work will continue beyond me. Any your questions? Mr. Chair? If there's no further questions. Thank you for coming in. I'm not sure we're going to hear about H66. Um, Representative Bodie is in committee yeah. right now. So, um, but that said, I really appreciate the annual report. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Duffy. Um, and thank you, General, everyone who came. I think it's um, it, it's it's it, this this report was asked for after a period of time where there just seemed to be no handle on the situation at all, um, and. Appreciate the time and effort on it to try and shape this report, and um, we will um, constantly look at it and look after it to make sure it's going to be um, a priority for us. Mr. And Chair, I think we were the first in the nation to do this, and this is our tenth year, I believe, um, in, in furnishing this um, report. And other states have now. Follow suit. Okay. Um, Representative well, I'm kind of disappointed that we're not going to have H666 while these people are here. And I guess well, I, I, I just was going to ask a question um, whether it's appropriate and you can guide me on this. But um, there's a couple of portions just into the intent of that legislation and, and thinking about um, the information regarding best practices for pre preventing sexual assault and sexual harassment employed by other branches. I think it's fascinating that we're kind of being held up as the example of who's doing that best practice. Um, and also just, I guess, the piece while we do have you would be if you do have any suggestions for specific legislative actions that we can take that would support the Vermont National Guard in, in your ongoing efforts. Because I think you have made incredible strides. And I think that, you know, the, the lights are getting beamed into every corner. And, and I just would ask if there's something that you would see rather than us just keeping the flashlight going and moving it around, whether there's something specific you would have in mind that would be of, of help from the legislative perspective. Yeah. We'll let you know. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, just 
So in committee, I'll have to ask if you're comfortable with this. So I just saw today that <coughs> former Representative Gino Sullivan, who, who started this um, sexual assault, who, who, who was a sponsor of the first sexual assault bill and has been working with Representative Odie on this bill. Um, I didn't know that she was here today. She was behind the brick wall. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when she heard me say that Representative Odie wasn't here, she stepped out to make her own tone. Um, hey, I leave it to the committee to determine whether or not we would treat rep former Representative O'Sullivan as a witness who can speak to the bill as one of the proponents, or we can. Um, schedule a time to do it. And this is a bill that um, represent, former Representative O'Sullivan has been working on. And to be complementary to these reports, we've seen and we've seen the guard itself take on not so much specific elements of the bill because it was at, it's asking for a pretty unique thing. But the guard's work has furthered along much more so than it had been past when we first started the report. And um, and so so committee, rather than making an executive decision on my own, if if hearing from um, former Representative um, O'Sullivan on this is acceptable. As a build, kind of as a build presentation or build explanation, then I would be happy to entertain that. If it's on good, people are uncomfortable with that at this time, then I would also um, be appreciative of that too. I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to hijack anybody or the process itself. I just want to lay it out there. Um, Representative Power, member, I uh, personally would like to hear from former representative um, Gina O'Sullivan, I know how how hard she works for the guard. And um, since she is here, I would love to hear from her. So my vote would be yes. <laughs> representative Murphy. I think it would be wonderful and I appreciate her making the effort. I would just suggest that it be considered as background and as testimony rather than as a bill introduction because right. as a non-representative currently, yeah. I think that wouldn't be an appropriate way to title it. It would be. Yeah. Representative Hango. Yeah, so my objection was just the, the, as always, the process of it that we typically hear a bill introduction by a sitting representative, and then we call in witnesses. So I guess if we do this, it will be in reverse order. But I do know that former Representative O'Sullivan worked um, with the Women's Caucus on this particular bill and that it came out of meetings that we held jointly with the um, National Guard and Veterans Affairs Caucus, with the Women's Caucus and with the TAGS office. So um, if we could just do it in reverse order because Representative Odie is not here and um, treat this as witness testimony, that's fine with me. Okay. And so <clears throat> as a professional training, <laughs> opportunity. What you're seeing is not legislative jujitsu. <laughs> we can make our own rules. Perhaps it's more, perhaps it's more yoga. Yes, it's more yoga. <laughs> um, as Representative Hango pointed out, the general process of introducing a bill um, is that is that the sponsor of the bill might come in and tell us what a bill is about. And then um, we may have either that same day or a follow-up day, the attorney who wrote the bill with that, with that person um, to do a walkthrough. And then we would call witnesses in support and, you know, for and against the bill. And then we would, if, we, if it became a priority, if it gained momentum, if it was something that we were going to take up, then we would call more witnesses and we would have what's called markup, which as, as you know, as you edit your own documents, you know that it can go through several or 12 layers of writing um, before it hits the floor. And so what we would do here is um, 
ask former Representative O'Sullivan to um, speak generally to the bill and not worry about the walkthrough or the details of it, but sort of to give a history of where the bill came from. Again, your part, not partnership, but your work in the past with the Women's Caucus. Um, I'll say right up, you know, whatever the proposals are here or in the past have been <coughs> protocol changes. And I mean, we are, when it comes to the general and the National Guard, we are unique. The legislature elects your leader, but after that, he serves, uh, he serves the commander in chief, plural, and there's no in between anymore. We don't, we don't have any kind of accountability with the general. And it's a unique circumstance that has its pluses and minuses. I think we've experienced those. Um, but that said, this proposal I think is for some for is to try to do have a sexual assault person at a level. And it's just, I'll just leave it there because it's it's um it's as potentially different than any other state could possibly be because of the situation with the Adjutant General and how he or she stands within our purview. And then we could add in federal law too, but you know, why, why bother? Oh, look, there they are. We waited long enough. <laughs> so, so, we have to move on to the Senate collapse, Mr. Chair. Happy days. And the only area in which we would differ would be the accountability to the legislature, because actually, at the end of a term, you have the ultimate accountability for an adjutant general. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Put him back in office. Right. By, by that, I mean, I mean that no one. You don't serve. You serve because you're an elected official, like we are, not at the pleasure of the commander in chief. Correct. Or us. You know, except through the elective process. So, um, all right. Well, you will head off to your next meeting here. Yes, sir. Um, I so appreciate. It. Let's get to take five minutes to let folks clear out if they're going, and we do have.